such a beautiful song, such a beautiful voice, and a really good guitarist going on there. If you would open your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, and Glenn, I'll occasionally look at you, but I guess I'm going to look over here most of the time. <clears throat> well, they are you guys. I don't ever think about the tech guys. Y'all were... If you open your Bibles to Matthew, we're looking at the 11th chapter. And we're going to look at the first six verses of Matthew chapter 11. When Jesus had finished giving instructions to his 12 disciples, he departed from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now, when John, and that is John the Baptist, when John, while imprisoned, heard of the works of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the expected one, or shall we look for someone else? Jesus answered and said to them, Go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who does not take offense at me. And may God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. In 1926, perhaps the strangest auction to have ever happened took place in Washington, D.C. The U.S. Patent, Patent Office took 150,000 plus obsolete patent models and put them up for auction. There were some very unusual patent models, like there was a bed bug buster. I'm not exactly sure what that looked like and how it worked. There was an illuminated cat that was supposed to scare off mice. Then there was this snoring device. The snoring device consisted of a tube that you put in your mouth and then it went around to your ear so that when you snored, you woke yourself up and not your companion. In a sense, there were 150,000 laughs and giggles that were put up for auction. But in another sense, there were 150,000 broken dreams. 150,000 disappointments. It may seem that it's highly inappropriate at this time of year to talk about broken dreams and to talk about disappointments, but the truth is, sadly, the Christmas season is a time of great disappointments. A Christmas season is a time when expectations are often high, maybe even too high, and when they're not met, there are broken hearts. I read the old bits every day, the Clarion Ledger and, and the Meridian Star. First of all, I'm checking to make sure I'm not there. But it's amazing, every year between Thanksgiving and Christmas, there are an increased number of deaths every year. Joblessness, the loss of jobs, not as bad this Christmas season has been some, but alcoholism, drug abuse, and there really is a thing called the Christmas blues. Anyone that struggles with depression knows what that experience is. In many senses, the Christmas season is a season of broken dreams and of disappointments. The setting of this passage that we have just read of the John the Baptist, his being in prison and his doubts comes in a surprising way because earlier when we hear of John the Baptist and Matthew, it's an incredibly exciting opportunity. He had been in the wilderness preaching repentance and people had been coming to him in droves to be baptized for the repentance of sins. But over and over again he kept saying there was someone else coming, someone else greater than I am. He said, I'm not even worthy to unbuckle his sandals. And then one day that someone came before him 
And John the Baptist pointed at him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And what the casual reader may not realize is that when Jesus came to John the Baptist, they already knew each other. They were first cousins. They probably knew each other very well, which makes John the Baptist's declaration even more incredible. Can you imagine pointing at your first cousin and saying, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world? I can't imagine ever doing that. But now, several months later, John the Baptist is in prison. And he sends one of his disciples to Jesus to ask the question, Are you really the one? Or are we looking for someone else? Like 150,000 broken dreams, that question drips with brokenness. It drips with disappointment. How did this happen? How did this come about? It's amazing to read commentaries from an earlier period, the early part of the 20th century. Commentators bent themselves like pretzels to try to explain that this isn't really what it really is. That John didn't really doubt because good Christians don't doubt. And so they try to explain it away some way, which is really ridiculous. It is what it is. The Bible presents truth and it presents it to us raw and harsh sometimes. This is a hard reality. John the Baptist is in prison. His life will be taken from him soon in execution as he is beheaded. It is a very real, it's very real the anguish that he is feeling. In the broader sense of the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11 is a turning point. The scholars say you can divide Matthew into five sections or five books. And this is the beginning of the book of doubts and conflict. Because it begins with John the Baptist, and from 11 it continues on in 12 with con continually increased conflict and difficulties. Just a quick survey of chapter 11, verses 1 through 15 is John's doubt, and then Jesus vindicating John, Jesus speaking highly of John. Then in verses 16 through 19, there's the unresponsive generation. How are they unresponsive? Jesus describes it this way. Someone's playing the flute and you don't dance. Or someone's doing a funeral dirge and you don't mourn. In other words, there are people that are just unemotional. Un they're stoic. They're unresponsive. And then he says, and this unresponsive generation looks at John and says, he's demon possessed. And then he says, this unresponsive generation looks at me and says, I'm a glutton and that I am a drunkard. Then in verses 20 to 24, he mentions two cities, the unrepentant cities, apparently cities that had rejected him or probably his disciples as they were out doing the ministry he sent them to do. And he pronounces a curse upon them, a woe statement upon them. Then in verses 25 to 30, he talks about the weary, the burden, the heavy laden. And he says, you can come to me. And I'll give you rest. My burden is light. My yoke is easy. It's an interesting chapter in its, all the extremes that are there. With John the Baptist, he speaks of him tenderly. He tenderly corrects him and vindicates him. To the unresponsive generation, he in essence says, history is going to judge you. He leaves it to the judgment of history. To the unrepentant cities, he himself pronounces a curse against them. But to the weary and heavy laden, which would include those with doubts and struggles, he invites them to come and rest. The load is light. Two are judged, two are graced. Doubt was graced, it was not judged. This was John the Baptist's question. It was not a question of one of, of his disciples. It was not a question of one of Jesus' disciples. How did this come about to happen? The text itself, in verse 6, cuts to the central issue. John's issue was Jesus 
himself. He was questioning because of what Jesus was doing. Because of what Jesus was preaching. The source of John's doubt was Christ himself. Now, there are a lot of things that put John in the position that he was. One was he dared to point to Herod and talk about his sins, and that was the wrong thing to do to the wrong person. He ended up in jail, and he'll end up being beheaded because of it. But there's some other things that are going on here. Jesus and John were cousins. They had known each other. John had this strong calling of God in his life to go preach and prepare the way. He knew who he was, and he knew who he was not. And he was not the one that was to come, but he knew he was to prepare the way for him. And when Jesus came to him to be baptized, he recognized him. He knew that he was the Lamb of God. But then, immediately after that, in Matthew chapter Luke to Matthew chapter 3, Jesus starts calling his disciples. And guess who's not on that list? John the Baptist. When Jesus called his disciples, he did not call his cousin to be among them. Maybe that was a disappointment in John's life. And then Jesus began to do things that John didn't understand. John was rough, and he was a very simple man. He had a very simple task, and he lived a very simple life. He thundered against sin. He called the Pharisees vipers. He spoke as one who would bring judgment upon all sinners. John came on a mission of judgment. But then he hears what Jesus is doing and what Jesus is saying and what Jesus has done. Jesus has gathered around 12 unimpressive men and left John out. He's been healing the sick, not condemning their sins. And when he spoke, the Sermon on the Mount happens between uh, the first introduction of John and this event in John. When he spoke, he spoke in kind and gentle terms and he elevated righteousness to an unprecedented level. John saw twisted men and he declared judgment and punishment upon them. Jesus saw twisted men and he declared mercy and grace for them. John saw injustice and he struck at it. Jesus saw injustice and he allowed injustice to strike him. In so many ways, when John the Baptist looked at Jesus, he was disappointed. There were so many disappointments in his life. Have you ever been disappointed? It happens. Things happen in life that disappoint us. I remember the second church I was called to, Northeast Mississippi, Ingemar Baptist Church, and the pastor's office was a closet. And I just asked this pastor search committee, can we do something to give the pastor a more appropriate office? And they said, oh yeah, we can do that. There's a Sunday school class right next door. We could, it's a very small class. That, you know, we could ask them to swap. <laughs> well, I had not learned the lesson yet that pastor search committees will promise you anything. And so I went to the little old ladies in that class and talked to them about swamping, swapping classes, rooms. And good gracious, a storm broke loose. And I stayed in my little closet. And I remember sitting in that little closet with a broken chair and with a desk, because the chair and the desk were so close, the chair was always hitting the desk. In the front of it, the, 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 uh, the finish had worn off and it was splintery. And I wore a tie every day, and I got getting splinters in my tie for when I'd lean against that desk. I got them in my finger. And I remember sitting in that office just feeling overwhelmingly disappointed. How in the world have I ended up here in this place? 
God had the last laugh because we had a wonderful time in ministry in that church and at that place. But life has disappointments. Notice Jesus' response. Jesus gets this message from John. Are you the one, really? Or are we looking for somebody else? And Jesus goes, sends back the message. Listen to what I've been saying. Look at what I have done. And he gives a, a list to him. And most of this list are quotations from the Old Testament about the Messiah. He said, the blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have the good news, the gospel preached to them. Look at what I've been, look at what I've been doing and listen to what I've been saying. And then he said, this is the ninth beatitude. Blessed is he who does not take offense at me. Or a different translation says, Blessed is he who does not stumble because of me. He says to John the Baptist, Consider who I am again. Consider Jesus again and again. Some people have the idea of faith that you have a conversion experience and then from now on everything's just hunky-dory. But the reality is you have a conversion experience and then at many points in life you kind of have to go back and revisit it. You have to go back and rethink. You have to go back and look at Jesus again and again and again. But it is from looking at Jesus again and again and again that we grow to know Him more, to understand Him better, and to follow Him deeper. We have to consider Jesus again. You see, hope dwells within us, not because we at one time just had a conversion experience. Hope dwells within us and continues to well within us when we again and again revisit that, again and again think about its meaning and significance. When we again and again look at Jesus and who Jesus is, what He said and what He did. Let me talk about three people who did that. Lee Strobel. Lee Strobel was a Chicago award-winning journalist, an investigative reporter who was kind of feared in Chicago because of the sharpness of his pen. He was raised Lutheran, but in high school he decided he was an atheist. He would have nothing to do with Christianity. One time when he was out of town on a business trip, his wife and daughter went to a church. And she came back filled with excitement from that experience. She told Lee about it, and Lee didn't want anything to do with it. But then his little girl kept saying, Daddy, come to church with us. And so finally, Lee did go to church. He went there expecting to be bored to tears by the music and to be intellectually insulted by the message. <clears throat> Instead, he went to a church where the music was really hip and where the message challenged him intellectually and spiritually. And it was the beginning of a process that led to his conversion and then led to a series of books, some of whom, which you may have heard of, The Case for Faith by Lee Strobel, The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel, and then another in a series of books he calls The Case of, where using his skills as a journalist, he looks at the things of faith. Raised in a Christian home, he left that faith, and then as an adult, he considered Jesus again. <clears throat> or another example, Malcolm Muggeridge. Now, most of you may have never heard of Malcolm Muggeridge. He's been dead for a long time. He, C.S. Lewis, you've probably heard of. C.S. Lewis said of Malcolm Muggeridge, he is the greatest master of the English language in existence today. 
great admiration for him. But Muggeridge, born in England, was raised by parents who were communist. He himself was a committed communist. He was a journalist, a writer, wrote several novels, and spent his life as a communist having nothing to do with religion or faith. He went to Russia when a little bit of a thaw began to happen and, and, and the communist government invited some sympathetic journalists to come and look at what was happening behind the Iron Curtain, he went to Russia at Easter one year. And while he was there, he asked, are there Easter services? And was told, yes, there were, and he asked if he might attend one. Well, they took him to the Moscow Baptist Church. He went there expecting there to be a, mainly a bunch of old ladies and old men and just a handful. But instead, he found a church that was filled standing room only with young and old, filled with energy, vivacious. This is the heart of the country that was trying to live out everything he believed in, he believed in as a communist where religion was supposed to go away. And it wasn't going away. It was vital, vivid, and alive. And he saw it. That began an intellectual journey. As a young man, he had considered Christ and considered that all of it was lies. Now, as a very mature man, he began to consider Christ again. In his 80s, Malcolm Muggeridge converted to Christianity. He was christened and baptized into the Catholic Church. And he wrote a book, Jesus Revisited, that was a tremendous insight into understanding who Christ is. Here again was someone who considered Jesus again, and it changed his life. Now, my third someone is really surprising. Her name is Anne Rice. She grew up in New Orleans, grew up in a devout Catholic family, attended Catholic schools, attended a Catholic university. In that Catholic university, in a Bible class, a very liberal priest told the class that the Gospels were mostly myth and legend written more than a hundred years after the fact. And she didn't question that. And that was part of her rejection of any faith. She became a prolific writer, but she was a gothic novelist. Her most famous series of books are called The Vampire Chronicles. She loved to write about vampires. Her most famous novel was Interview with the Vampire, which was made into a movie starring Tom Cruise, which is an extremely successful mu movie. She loved the dark side of things, the gothic. She wrote a lot of other things that weren't gothic, but that's what she was famous for. Then, as a grown adult living in California, she read the Gospels. She read them. And what surprised her was, this didn't sound like myth or legend. And as a literary professor, she knew what myth and legend was. This sounded like eyewitness accounts. And so she began exploring and studying and talking to people. She and her husband moved back to New Orleans where she re-embraced the faith of her childhood and became a confessing Catholic once again. Then she wrote a series of books on the life of Jesus and on her conversion experience. Now, if you know anything about her, you also know that about 10 or 15 years ago, she renounced Christianity. But let me 
That's the headline. You read beyond the headline, this is what she did. She looked at Christianity as it's being practiced today and didn't want anything to do with it. She renounced modern Christianity, but she did not renounce Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. She rejected us. She didn't reject Christ. And it's hard for me to imagine how someone who writes about vampires could really fit in among us anyway. <clears throat> Anne Rice, someone who was raised in the faith, and rejected the teaching of faith, but as a mature adult, considered Jesus again. And when she considered him again, she came to know him as Lord and Savior. John entered a place, a dark place, a dark dungeon physically where he was being held, but an even darker place in the soul. A place where there was doubt. There was questioning. And then he did what all of us ought to do when we have doubt. Go ask Jesus. Go ask Jesus. Consider Jesus again. And consider him again. And consider him again. If you, this Christmas season, in this room or join us by radio, if you're filled with the darkness of doubt and discouragement, during this Christmas, consider Jesus again. Would you bow with me as we pray? Father, help us to realize that faith is not a once and done thing. Faith is an ongoing dynamic. It's a walk. It's a journey. And sometimes the journey is through difficult passages, difficult places. And in the darkness of those places, sometimes our minds begin taking us places. Help us to realize that we can always come to you when we feel weary and burdened and heavy laden. We can always come to you and that the walk of faith means considering Jesus fresh and anew over and over. Thank you that in your grace and your mercy you came to give us eternal life. You came to be one of us to die upon the sin, to take our sins from us, to give us the gift of eternal life. And for that, you are worthy of our worship and worthy of our praise. For it's in Christ Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.